Good morning and welcome to worship right here at Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Chehalis, Washington. And as you can see, I'm back in the sanctuary. I'm here today because we're going to talk a little bit about church connection as part of one of the seven marks of a healthy congregation. So I'm so glad that you joined us for worship today. So let us worship God. Please listen as I read our call to worship. Come from the fields of your daily labors. Return from your journeys that have taken you far from home. Come here is rest and renewal. We gather hearts ready to receive God's living word. Come to this table where all find welcome and this font where grace overflows. Come into the presence of the living Lord. We come to praise God, the sender and the sent. Please join me as I pray the opening prayer. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies are everlasting. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith, let us make our confession to God as I read our corporate prayer of confession aloud and then together we confess individually in silence. Let us pray. God, you send us prophets to proclaim your coming reign. You send us out as witnesses to embody your justice, kindness, and mercy. Yet we shrink from your call to serve as messengers of your kingdom. We cling to safe surroundings and turn from the demands of discipleship. Forgive us, we pray, embolden us, and send us again as heralds of your good news. Please take a moment to pray in silence. My friends, who's in a position to condemn? Well, it's only Christ. Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power over us, and Christ prays for us. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. That old life has passed away, and a new life has begun. My friends, know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. As a sign of that peace, let us share the peace of Christ with one another this day. As I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Please join us as we sing, We Are the Body of Christ.
So, my friends, as we've gathered here now to pray as a people, we first have some celebrations to lift up today. So to Alan, Mac, Sam, Nikita, Connie, Karen, Jennifer, Heidi, Linda, Walt, Linda, Carolyn, Cheryl, Emma, Floyd, Heather, Janice, and Terry, we have a song to sing to you. As we continue with our celebrations, let us also lift up Gary and Kay, Pam and David, Sean and Carol, and Zeke and Nancy, which is today, we say happy anniversary. As we continue to pray as a people, we do have some corporate prayers for us all to share in this week. So as the Kirks have asked us to continue to pray for Barbara, and David Martin. Uh, we also pray for Ellen Stonecipher and her family. Uh, pray for Ellen's health and uh, as she goes through a transition right now. Um, we continue to pray for uh, Carol Days, uh, has asked us to pray for Nellie Andrews. And uh, we pray, pray for Jeff Smith and his healing along with uh, Mel Bloom, Janet Bloom, Clyde Berry. Uh, we pray for uh, anyone that's been affected by COVID and uh, whether it's through job opportunities or whether it's through business hardships, whether it's been through financial hardships, health issues, those who have died or who have suffered from this uh, terrible illness uh, and anybody that has to make hard decisions during this time, that we continue to pray for all of us as we walk in this season together, reminding ourselves that we are in this together and we need to care and love one another uh, during this very difficult time. We also, I wanna thank you personally for praying for first Nicole and I as we went on a short vacation a couple weeks ago, but also for you praying for Ron Marshall and I, who have been co uh, the commissioners to, for the Olympia Presbytery at our General Assembly, which just concluded last night. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, we definitely felt it and we love those prayers. Uh, <clears throat> we had a wonderful time uh, doing uh, General Assembly virtually. Uh, one of the very few denominations that actually did so. And so we kind of made history there. And then we also made history when we elected our um, Ilona Street Stewart and Reverend Gregory Bentley as our co-moderators this year. Um, both are people of color. That's the first time we've ever done that as a General Assembly. So those are just a few of the things that we did with history and uh, it was just a wonderful time. And uh, as the weeks go by, I'm sure I'll share more of my experiences at this unique General Assembly. And so, my friends, with the continued unrest in our country, continued dividing lines, and continued uh, ways where I think we keep separating ourselves when we should be actually coming together, uh, over, being able to work through our differences as we concentrate on the similarities. My friends, uh, we definitely live in a time that's historical. And so, let us pray for one another. Let us pray that we listen more, uh, have empathy more and care more during this time. Uh, and that goes for all. And I just pray that uh, for each and every one of us, and I please invite you to join with me in that prayer this week. So my friends, it's time for us to go in and have our individual prayers where we share them silently with God. And after a moment of uh, silence, I will lead us into the Lord's Prayer. My friends, let us pray.
Gracious God, hear our prayers. Hear all of our celebrations and dance with us. Hear all of our concerns and gather us close and lament with us, heal with us. Provide us your healing mercy. Provide us your wonderful grace. Provide us love, understanding, forgiveness, mercy, compassion, gentleness. Ah, Lord, you are the giver of life. And let us continue to celebrate life as we bring your life into the world, as we share your life with everyone that we meet. And as we glorify you by our time that we walk with Christ, who has taught us how to love one another, how to love you, God, more. And through the Holy Spirit, through the wonderful mercies of creation that you have done, and through the beautiful work of your Son, Jesus, our Messiah, our Christ, who gathers us now to then send us out to love and care for each other. Let us do so by remembering the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you for joining us in worship today. As we encourage our WPC community to give to WPC now, we also encourage our guests today to give to the church that you may belong to. All of us are walking in this season together and we acknowledge that all of us could need the help. If you would like to give to WPC, the banner will now appear on the screen to help guide our WPC community and anyone else who would like to give. The best way at this time is to mail your offering or tithe to Westminster Presbyterian Church, P.O. Box 710, Chehalis, Washington, 98532. We thank you for your generosity, and we continue to encourage all of us to be good stewards of all that God has gifted to us, and may we continue to care for one another during this unique season. Thank you. Let us now sing our doxology to give our thanks to God for the gifts God has given to us as we share them with each other. giving us a joy for generosity and a genuine love for those who are in need. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts and upon our lives that together we may bring healing and hope to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Loving God, your word has the power to restore our lives. Open our hearts to the presence of your spirit, for you are mighty to save. Amen. My friends, now let us go into scripture as we go into our lesson today, which can be found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 
34 to 42. My friends, let us hear the word of the Lord. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, as one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive a reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As going to the text, you may notice that my shirt's different. Quick explanation is that I didn't like the sermon. I actually did two of them. Uh, earlier this week when I taped everything else and I didn't like either one of them after uh, my time at General Assembly. And so I'm here Saturday night to uh, do one that feels right to my heart. So this is going to be as close as it gets to a Sunday morning on actual time. And so my friends, let us go into this text. And the way we're going to do that is uh, remind me of a game that I used to play, and I still do from time to time, but it's called Connect the Dots, where you have this jumbled mass of dots, and they, don't, they, they look like chaos and disorder, and then they all come into order when you go in some sequential manner. You are able to see like a, a, an image or words or even a phrase. And so that's what we're going to do as we dive into this text. So as we look at it, what we're dealing with is ecclesial health, which is one of the marks of a healthy congregation. <clears throat> and uh, ecclesial health, the way that we're going to look at it today is our connectedness. Uh, we as Presbyterians, we enjoy our connectedness. We are connected to, with each other in many different ways, uh, particularly through our denomination. Heck, I was with, with all, of our, all of our presbyteries this, uh, the, these last, this week. Uh, doing the business of the General Assembly. And uh, if you'd like to know more about it, please talk to me about it. I'd love to share more about it, but not today. Today, I'm gonna to look at this connectedness and how it can be very healthy uh, if we look at connectedness. And this text, I think, will help us do just that. Here in this text, uh, Jesus says that he is not coming in peace. He's actually bringing a sword and dividing families, fathers from, uh, fathers from sons, mothers from daughters. Um, and the, the whole premise of this in my, in my interpretation is that God, Jesus is saying that we put God first and family second, that nothing comes before God. And if we do that, it's going to cause friction in the family. Uh, it's going to cause problems because we're trying to do what God is asking us and not what we think is best. Uh, and we'll, let's kind of dissect this we thing, this family thing of why it's so important to put God first. So let's start connecting some of those dots. When we start thinking of our family, to think of some of the things that you, what does it come to you? What comes to mind to you when you hear the word family? What, what is the first things you think about? And most of the time, I'm going to guess it's positive. But what are some of the negative things about being in family? Uh, I'm just kind of run through those, okay? Because when we start looking at it, the first thing is, uh, if we put our family first, um, what does that look like? Well, the first, it looks like that we won't do what God asks. Is we, we, want to, we will not want to go out. We will want to stay with our family. 
We will want to only do family eyed things and family becomes our dynamic and we never get to experience the greater church family. Uh, we always put something else in front of it. Uh, maybe it's the second, maybe going to church is like the second or third option. Maybe watching this video is a third or fourth option. Um, and that's your choices. And when we start looking at, well, how do we learn how to love one another? How do we learn how to love our family? Well, we have to go outside the family to learn that. We have to look to how God relates to God's family. And so as we look at it, uh, when we make all of our excuses and all the ways that we want to have family first, it will cause friction when God comes first. I unfortunately know this firsthand. Uh, when I left my family, my related folks from Iowa and left St. Paul Presbyterian Church that I served there for five years as a youth director to go to seminary. And that caused a lot of friction. It broke some of the systems that were in place in our family and it caused a lot of friction. And it still does to this day. Uh, then going further, I go to a, uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church in Charleston, South Carolina, developed family there, then left that family and went to First Presbyterian Church in Seminole, Texas and developed family there. And then now I'm here and had to leave that family and developed a family here. And over the last five and a half years, about was the last five, almost six years now, We've been a family, working on things, talking about things, and dealing with family issues. And that does come at a cost because if I'm on vacation or I'm on, or if I'm doing something on my personal time and something, uh, an emergency happens here, I have to respond to that. Uh, where, because I'm called to be your pastor, I'm called to be a servant to you. And so a lot of times your needs come before the needs of my own family because I know that that's part of what it means to be in the family of God. It also means that there's times when I draw hard lines like <laughs> Sabbath time and rejuvenation and, and education. All of that is very healthy when we learn our boundaries. But when we do that, it always causes some friction. Like when I served as a moderator, it caused some friction within our own congregation because I wasn't here as much. And so my friends, that is what I'm talking about. Another thing that I'm looking at is our family mindset. What are some of your traditions? What are some of the things that you think about oh, it makes your family great? Think about that. And now, what are some of the traditions, some of the... Uh, uh, things that you do as a family that you don't like that you uh, the things like uh, I didn't like it when my parents did it to me So I'm not going to do it to my children that kind of understanding uh, What are some things uh, children that? Uh, that gets you frustrated about what your parents do and things that you just frustrate you that happens when we deal with family systems and family mindsets we typically uh, get into a very uh, insular understanding that this is the way we do things, whether you like it or not. And when we do that, uh, it doesn't look outward. It do you don't particularly care about your neighbors. You particularly care about yourself first. We tend to always become more secluded in nature. Have you experienced that at all? Because when we start thinking of it, uh, when we think of our traditions and we start using the word them, us and them, uh, and when you start acting in a tribal mindset, so yeah, I'm gonna go there. Uh, tribal, uh, Republican, Democrat, or two tribes that are at war with each other apparently in this country. Um, and I find it amusing and heartbreaking all at the same time, where we take a very judgmental eye to whoever we do not like and never look at ourselves with that same critical eye. Uh, we tend to follow only certain media outlets, certain things that we Google or, or take our news from. We never look at other sides or we never looked at facts. 
from either side because we're so danged determined that we are right and they are wrong. Um, and that, my friends, is something that I think we need to hear Jesus about. Jesus takes a sword to that mentality, cuts that, says, no, no, that's not who you are. That's not being a family of God. Uh, it looks a lot different. And so when I this, so I will get to these parts of what it looks like in the family of God in a minute when we put God first instead of family first. But there's one other one. It's called the family dynamics. It's the how ways that we are in and the ways that we are out. Like when I left Iowa, I found myself on the outside looking in. Had no idea that that would happen to me, um, but it did. Uh, I became a stranger to my own nephews and nieces that are back in Iowa that are not my sisters. And so I, uh, I became an outsider because I followed God, because I did what I needed to. I had this, all of a sudden I had to relearn some of the dynamics of my family. I had to learn what was normal and what wasn't normal. I thought I knew everything, but when I left that system, it became, I was, uh, I had to relearn what normal was and that things aren't the way it used to be. And, um, and when we look at that, we also start thinking about a scarcity mindset where we try to hoard. This is mine. This is mine. This is yours. I see this a lot when people, when matriarchs and patriarchs die, where the siblings literally fight inward with each other because of their perceived understandings of the dynamics and what is in, what is out, what is mine, what is yours. And there become these fights, not all the time, but it can happen, particularly during uh, death times or in separation times. My friends, that all is part of this when we put family first, when we put our own needs first, these are things that happen. And from that, we tend to go towards violence. We tend to use hateful words and hateful speech. And we typically have a death mentality. We are always afraid that's, that we're going to die and we want to save ourselves. Did you see that in the text today? We want to save ourselves from whatever calamities. And so we tend to, to exclude our neighbors and exclude everyone else around us. And it's just me first mentality. Have you seen that? Are you living that? We all can fall victim to that. And I don't like the word victim. We can all fall prey to that. We can all be disillusioned that that is the real story when we put family first. That's hard for us to hear because we tend to want to make everything so pretty and sterile and clean. We don't want to look at the messiness, but Jesus is a messy person. Jesus doesn't mind messy. In fact, he sees messy as healthy. He sees messy as uh, the, so being in and getting in and getting your hands dirty and, and really putting in the blood equity, the sweat equity to love one another. And what does that look like? And so he redefines it by putting that balance, by saying that if you're going to save your own life, you're, there's no life to save because you're always insular and you're not really doing what you are been what you have been created to do and to be. So we put on this da, this cross, this uh, beautiful thing that uh, up there you can see it, it's right there, a cross. How many of you recognize that that is a capital punishment tool? It's like a lethal injection or an electric chair sitting out there. And this is what the transformational love of Jesus looks like. When we start looking at our connectedness of how we're connected to God and how we're connected really with each other, it transforms things that are meant for death and they are now transformed for life. You ever really thought about that? Every time you see a cross that it has been transformed from death to life, the same kind of imagery that we have from an empty tomb. 
You know, when we go to a tomb, we expect to see death, but there's not. It's, there's life. There's that switch. And that's what Jesus does when he brings this uh, metaphorical sword. He is now using this uh, cutting to get us out of our comfort zones, to get us out of the ways that we think we should be and insular to getting us out of that and to helping us see the world that really lives around us and to live in that world, not hide or isolate from that world. So he first says the words of these rewards, and I think I love this movement of rewards. The first reward is profit. To be able to deliver the good news and to be able sometimes to deliver painful words some of us, uh, I think almost all of us, need to go and experience uh, painful conversations, uh, particularly right now. Uh, you, I'm sure if you've visited my Facebook page, you can see that there's uh, a lot of activity on it. And it's because I'm dealing with racism right now and uh, on many different forms. And it's difficult and painful conversations. And I'm okay with that. And if you would want to talk to me about it, please do. You don't have to put it on my Facebook page or private message. You come talk to me. We will gladly talk about racism because I'm not using it as a, uh, a bait tool. I'm not using it as a political word. I'm using it as it, what, as it really means. It's a, the, the sinful nature of how we put ourselves above other people according to what they look like or act like, or where they come from. And we all have a tendency to make that mistake from time to time. And that is a sin. And so we have to really have painful conversations about it. What does it mean? And to unpack that, and that what that does mean is that when a prophet normally comes up and, he, and the prophet will lift up a mirror and say, do you see what you are doing? And if you do not change your ways, bad things are going to probably happen. So repent, turn your face toward God and move in this direction. And a lot of times the prophet is met with hatred and scorn and persecution and even death. Even Jesus met death, scorn and persecution. But that is what we need to do. When we put God first, we put the word first. We put that movement of saying that we can do better. God has blessed us and we can do better with these blessings. We can actually bless one another and we're not doing that. And so we have to, from time to time as prophets, point out where we can do better because we deserve better, we know we can do better, because God believes we can do better. And that's when we need to draw closer to one another and draw closer to our God and look at ways of how we can be unified and include everybody around us. Instead of pointing out our differences, we start finding the ways that make us who we all are together, how we are connected. That next dot, is righteousness. The righteousness reward. The righteousness reward looks uh, is when we actually put into practice what uh, discipleship is teaching us to do. When we actually become, uh, live as disciples, we read the word, we pray, we go out and uh, share the good news, we go out in the community and we evangelize and we um, love one another. We actually put all this into practice and it make it a part of our lives. This again from other from outside will be met with many different feelings, some good, some bad. But many times it will be met with a little bit of negativity. And that is okay. When we put God first, we can expect that there will be negative as well as positive. Uh, experiences that will happen when we follow Christ. 
When we serve others, we have to put our own, put their needs in front of ours, and, and that can cause problems. But it also helps us see how we can empathize with one another, grow closer to one another, to walk with our brother and sister. We no longer want to use the words us and them. We talk about we, we as the family of God. And we will sing these beautiful songs like we are singing today about, a, about how we are together. And that is not a, a stopping point. We always are seeing who else is in the family. We are always looking to see who God brings into our family. It's an outward emotion for us to then be healthy, to bring others in and feel included. And there is the main, these two sacraments our inclusion, that these are ways that we are all included in the family of God. And so it's out in front of us every chance we get that of how we are united and how we are to live with one another as we serve our God who's teaching us and walking with us and, and helping us grow as disciples. Which leads me to the third one which is drink with drink for the little ones. This is being able to take care of those who are vulnerable or at risk or those who are on the margins. I'm gonna spread this out. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna use it in this way, is that I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about where, uh, how, how all the different groups that are on the margins and how, and how we should take care of them. I've preached about that many times. I'm gonna talk about using the gifts of the Spirit that each of us have been given gifts to then share with others and to then add to the beauty of the person next to us. That if we only use our gifts for ourselves, it's useless because we never get to have, see the full variety of when we put all of our gifts together. And some of those gifts are going to come from people who are not like us, people who are not um, uh, in our in our economic class, who are not our skin color. Um, they may not even speak our langu uh, the language that we're familiar with. My friends, we are connected. And Jesus says that if we drink, give drink to the little ones, that there's a beautiful reward. Typically, uh, when others see us, we, they typically find that it's like, wow, why would you do that? Oh, you're so compassionate. You're so kind. And they push it off on you. Like that's not something that they're supposed to do. When in fact, it's what we're all been designed to do. We're supposed to actually help and care for one another. When there is calamity, like right now, when we are having a COVID um, experience that's going on, uh, when we are dealing with uh, racial tensions, this is not a time for us to point fingers and divide. This is actually the perfect time to get to know why people are angry, why are people frustrated on all sides, and having people who are angry at each other to sit down and talk to one another. And if you watch closely and avoid all the propaganda that's out there on, on all, many of the media outlets, you will see people coming together. And my friends, that is exactly what we are to do. We are to come together and drink and provide drink for the little ones. You may feel like one of the little ones. You might feel like an outsider right now. And you may feel it's because of the color of your skin. And you probably have every, uh, to me, you have every right to feel that way. And who are the people that are bringing you drink and providing you drink? And are you spending time with the people who give you drink? Uh, I love how Jesus uses Samaritans, which is normally a, a derogatory per, a slang word, and derogatory people that normally Jewish people would never associate with. And Jesus continually helps to show that the family of God includes Samaritans. And so, my friends, who are the people that, are, that get you agitated and angry and begin to realize that God loves that person just as much as that per God loves you? And that you, as part of the family of God, should get to know your brother and sister. There is not a them. There's only us. We all live on this planet together. That's just a plain fact. And we need to learn how to love one another 
even our enemies, whoever we perceive to be our enemies, because they're not, at the end, our enemies. That's how we uh, diffuse violence and hatred and death, because if we are start seeing the world as a family of God and we put away all the things that make us un that we think are comfortable and now become uncomfortable in this world, we will start seeing unity, inclusion, and peace. And my friends, we will see that Jesus transforms our lives from a death mentality of family first to this God first understanding where not even death can separate us from the saving grace and love of our Lord. My friends, that is the message. If we start looking this all the way over and looking at uh, all this confusion and we connect all the dots, we see the saving grace of our Lord. Our saving grace. That nothing will separate us from the love of Christ and the love of God. And so for us, we are the dots. Jesus, the God, the Holy Spirit is our connection. And if we walk with our God and we listen to, the, listen to Jesus and walk with Jesus and have the Spirit move in and around and through us, we will see the connections that we have with everyone that is around us. So we are to put all of this into our ministry of connectedness. That's very healthy. When we start seeing and breaking down, and we're just not a Presbyterian, but we're a Christian. We're not just a Christian, but we are in the family of God. And we have no idea who God includes in that family. So we treat everyone as like they are a part of the family. That, my friends, is very good news. It's not easy news, and then say there we went through all this stuff, but all of that uneasiness can never separate us from the love of God, and we need to continue to walk in this love, in this unity, and as we do so, we can start by doing it from right here. Wherever you are sitting or here in this church, we can now start this first dot is here, and with God's help, we move outward and start connecting to the other dots. And may we do so now and forever in Christ's holy name. Amen. Please join us in our song, Make Us One.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. And as we prepare to leave this place and go out into the world, let us go out knowing that we are all connected. No matter what we, how we think and how we act, we are united by Christ. And let us never forget that. So as we go out into this world, let us treat everyone as a brother and sister and treat it as an opportunity to continue to glorify God in all that we do, to reflect the love of Jesus Christ to the world, and continue to have the Holy Spirit build relationships with, with, or with each other as well as with God as we walk on this journey of life together. Now and for always, amen.